Hello, I'm Dr. Jacob Hudis. Welcome to my Quantum Mechanics Made Easy Beginner Problem Playlist. In this presentation, I will discuss the Schrodinger equation and the infinite square well in one and three dimensions. Before introducing the Schrodinger equation, I want to briefly discuss Newton's second law. On this slide, I've written Newton's second law, F equals MA. We all know it and love it. Newton's second law is the fundamental equation of classical mechanics. But where did Newton's laws come from? The scientific method is how scientists discover fundamental truths about the world, known as the laws of physics. The scientific method consists of the following steps, observation, formulating a hypothesis, also known as an educated guess, conducting an experiment, and computing the consequences. Newton's laws of motion originated from this process. Through careful observation and thought, Newton made an educated guess about how the world works and formulated his laws of motion. Take Newton's second law as an example. Newton hypothesized the second law based on careful analysis. This law was then tested and verified through experiment and computations. This is how scientific law originates, and it's also why science is so challenging. You have to make a guess, and most scientists guess incorrectly because it's difficult. People don't tend to ask how Newton arrived at his laws because when we learn them, they make intuitive sense based on our experience in the world. To ask how Newton arrived at his laws is to ask what he thought about for 20 years. It's also possible Newton was an alien and he was just given the information from the mother colony. And on this slide is the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is a differential equation. I'm going to go through an example in the next few slides to explain the equation and tell you what each one of these terms mean. It's a differential equation. Psi is the wave function and it tells you the probability of where you can find the particle. The Schrodinger equation is the fundamental equation in quantum mechanics. Where did the Schrodinger equation come from? During the mid-1920s, there was growing experimental evidence suggesting wave-particle duality, such as the diffraction and interference pattern observed in electron scattering experiments. Inspired by Louis de Broglie's hypothesis that particles could exhibit wave-like behavior, Schrodinger aimed to formulate a wave equation that would describe these matter waves, similar to how classical wave equations describe sound or light waves. The Schrodinger equation is a hypothesis that lacks first principle derivation. It is a wave equation that Schrodinger proposed following the scientific method. His hypothesis proved correct, much like Newton's laws of motion. It describes how the quantum state of a system changes over time, revealing the wave-like nature of particles and the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. Now let's look at an example to explain each one of the terms in the Schrodinger equation, as well as how we apply it. In any quantum mechanics problem, it's essential to start by clearly defining the system you will be analyzing. The simplest quantum mechanical system is a particle in a box with infinitely hard, impenetrable walls known as an infinite square well potential. For a particle in a box, the potential energy is zero inside the box, so the particle only possesses kinetic energy. At the edge of the box, the potential energy is infinite, which means the particle can't escape the box. If the particle were to leave the box, it would require infinite potential energy, which is not possible. This is the system. It's a small particle, like an electron or a proton. This is the potential energy function. The potential energy is zero in the box, and the potential energy is infinity at zero and L, which are the boundaries of the box. The procedure to solve any problem involving the Schrodinger equation is the same. After you define the system, the next step is you write down the Schrodinger equation. This is the Schrodinger equation. It's a differential equation. H is Planck's constant. M is the mass of the particle that you're analyzing. V is the potential of the potential energy of the particle. This is an eigenvalue equation, and E is the energy of the particle. Once we've written down the Schrodinger equation, and we've defined the system, we replace the potential with whatever potential it is that we're looking at. In this case, the potential is zero within the box, so this term goes to zero, and this is the updated Schrodinger equation for this particular problem. Now we have a differential equation, and you can solve this differential equation by dividing both sides by h-bar squared over 2m. That leads to this equation here, and this is simple to solve. We can simplify it a little bit by writing k as the square root of 2me over h-bar squared, and the solution to this is psi of x is equal to some constant a times sine of kx plus some constant b times sine of kx, where this is k. Step three in any Schrodinger equation problem is to apply the boundary conditions. In this case, the boundary conditions are psi of 0 equals psi of l equals 0. Psi is related to the probability of finding the particle, and for this simple problem, the particle can't be outside of the box, which means the wave function can't exist outside of the box. So the wave function of location 0 equals the wave function of location L. It has to equal to 0. The particle is confined within the box. Plugging in 0 for psi, 
psi of zero equals a sine of zero plus b cosine of zero, and this must equal to zero. This tells us that b is equal to zero because cosine of zero is one, and the only way this can equal to zero is if b is equal to zero. So our updated wave function is psi n equals a sine of n pi x over l, or a sine of kx. Step four is normalizing the wave function. The wave function squared is equal to the probability of finding the particle. What the normalization means is if I look for the particle everywhere in space, there has to be a 100% chance that I find it. It has to be somewhere, and so if I look for it everywhere, I will find it. You take the integral of psi squared, and that has to equal to one, and that means there's a 100% chance of finding the particle if you look for it everywhere. If you take this psi and you plug it in, that's the equation right here, and that tells you that a is equal to the square root of two over l. This is our updated wave function. Step five is applying the other boundary condition. The other boundary condition is psi of l is equal to zero. If I plug l in for x, that gives me this equation, and the only way that this equation works is if the argument of the sine function is equal to n times pi. So we have kn times l is equal to n times pi, and this is how you apply the other boundary condition. This might feel a little confusing at first, but you should get used to this sort of analysis because this is done in every single quantum mechanics problem. This n is where the quantization condition comes from. The quantized wave number now becomes this because remember k was equal to the square root of 2me over h bar squared, and this tells us that the energy levels are quantized. What this tells us is that for the particle in this infinite square well, it doesn't have a continuous spectrum of energies. The energies come in discrete steps. They're small steps, but they're discrete steps. So you can have energy of E1, which is this number here. It depends on the mass of the particle and the length of the particle and Planck's constant. Or you could have 4 times E1 or 9 times E1. You cannot have 10 times E1. That's not an allowed energy. The first thing that we've learned is in a quantum mechanical bound system, the energies are quantized. And of course, the most important example of this is an atom where atoms, where the electrons in atoms have these quantized energy levels. How do we interpret the wave function? These are the wave functions plotted, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3. This is psi n. Psi 1, you would replace kn with k1. Psi 2, you would replace kn with k2, and so on. And these are the first three wave functions plotted. And how do you interpret the wave function? The wave function squared tells you the probability of finding the particle at a given location in space. If you're in energy state E1, that corresponds to a wave function psi 1, and that tells you that you're most probable to find the particle in the center of the box, and it'll be less likely to find it here or here. If you're in the next energy state, E2, that tells you that you will never find the particle at the center of the box, because psi 2 squared is this function. The particle would never be at the center of the box. It would have a high probability to be here and here, and psi 3 squared looks like this. You'd never find the particle here and here. This problem covers many of the main concepts that come up in quantum mechanics, and that's why this is the problem that people learn from the beginning. But even after learning this problem, most people still feel confused and frustrated with the subject, but maybe it's better just to let go and say, okay, let me just take this as what it is. This is the meaning of these equations. If you're interested in math or physics tutoring, please check out my website, acephysics.org, and book a lesson today. We live in a three-dimensional world. We just solved the Schrodinger equation in one dimension, but if you really want to apply this to real applicable situations, you need to solve the Schrodinger equation in three dimensions. In three dimensions, the Schrodinger equation would look like this. Instead of just having a derivative with respect to x, there's a partial derivative with respect to x, a partial derivative with respect to y, and a partial derivative with respect to z, and the potential function is a function of x, y, and z. It's not just a function of x. If we're dealing with a particle in a three-dimensional box, again, the potential is zero inside the box, and it's infinity on all of the walls of the box, so this would be the Schrodinger equation in that case. To solve it is not very difficult, but it's a partial differential equation, and it's beyond the scope of this particular lesson. This is the solution. You can also check this as the solution just by taking this function. You can take that function and plug it back into this equation. You can see that it works. Ultimately, what this leads to is this is the wave function. It's a function of x, y, and z, and it has energy levels which depend on three numbers, nx, ny, and z, where these n's can range from zero to infinity. And to conclude, I just want to tell you that the Nobel Prize in Chemistry 
for the development of quantum dots was awarded in 2023. What are quantum dots? The structure of quantum dots are tiny, crystalline semiconductor particles that confine electrons in all three dimensions. They're analogous to particles trapped in a rigid, impenetrable box in quantum mechanics. Electrons can only occupy specific discrete energy levels determined by the dot's size and boundaries. The wave function of the electrons are sinusoidal within the dot and zero at the boundary, similar to a particle in a box model. This particle in a box has actually been created by making very tiny semiconductor, semiconductor particles extremely tiny. They have to be smaller than the de Broglie wavelength of the particle. And so these ideas of quantum mechanics are starting to implement themselves in real world applications. And soon they will be ingrained in our everyday lives. Are you in need of a great physics tutor? Dr. Hudis can help. Whether you're preparing for a high school test, AP test or college exam, let me help you ace it. Are you an eager high school student aiming to get ahead and prepare for college level physics? Or maybe you're a college student and you want to learn even more advanced physics. Dr. Hudis can help. Visit acephysics.org and schedule a lesson today.